In this episode of Travelog, we journey to the sub-zero climbs of northeast China. We'll discover how people live in a natural deep freeze before exploring the gorgeous that country that has made this region world famous. There's a common belief here that the people of northeast China are some of the hardest in the country. And to be honest, if you're going to survive in this kind of environment, you've got to be pretty tough. But if you're able to brave these Arctic temperatures, then there's an entire winter wonderland here to explore. And if you're especially bad, like me, then you'll know that the region around the Muldan River is home to some of China's best winterscapes. I'm Tiran He, and welcome to Travelog. I've come to Dunpo Lake, a combined seven-hour flight and drive from Beijing. Not exactly convenient, but then we're further north than Vladivostok in Russia. And it shows. In winter, Dunpo Lake and everything else in this UNESCO World Geopark turns into a frozen fantasy land. Temperatures here can drop as low as minus 30 degrees C. On the flip side, it does give you the chance to admire some icy works of art, or do a bit of tubing with the kids. There's plenty here to keep the young'uns busy. Is that you, Po? Anyway, so long as you wear thermals, a fleece, a good down jacket, a thick hat, and at least two layers of gloves and socks, you'll barely even feel the cold. So it's just after dawn and I never thought that for breakfast I'd be standing at the edge of a waterfall and a frozen one at that. But I mean, it's so cold right now that the whole place is frozen over. In fact, the water beneath me is steaming in comparison. But I mean, just look at this place. It's an absolutely beautiful, serene winterscape. Dingpo Lake is the largest volcanic barrier lake in China, and its frozen waterfall and frosty pines are a photographer's dream. As is the local attraction. That was waterfall diver Di Huanran taking his daily dip. <laughs> Formed some 10,000 years ago, when volcanic eruptions blocked off part of the Muldan River, Jingpo Lake is bigger in size than Manhattan. And every year in January, it plays host to a spectacular ice fishing festival. Gotta be very careful. Uh, so we've come here at seven o'clock in the morning. In fact, the fishermen have been here since sunrise uh, to set their nets, and it's not exactly how I envisaged ice fishing. I thought there would just be one guy with a fishing pole out in the middle of nowhere, but here it's a big group affair. We're kind of soon as you're dong, dong yung, that's I'm a dong, you know, they shout, what are they dong? <音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音> 那得多么长的杆子,那动在那边呢?那刚一动,一刚一,就几十米,二十来多米,一点点倒,那时候可可费心了。啊,那肯定,跟都看不见了是吧?你看这这这冰那么好。It's like threading, uh, threading a needle.拉拢吧,就往上去。啊。那咱们这个有什么顺序,因为我看这个网都已经快下完了。啊,马上就下完了。咱们得等多久才能有鱼啊? 那很快了,那说明咱们这鱼特别多,是吧? There we go, into the uh, deep abyss. My God, that looks so scary. It's like, oh, it's like a pit to hell. And 
I don't know if you can see from there. Look at all this ice. It does seem dangerous um, because, you know, I'm standing, I'm, I'm kneeling next to this gaping hole, but actually the ice is, it's about this thick, so there is no danger whatsoever of falling in. But, crikey. <laughs> yeah, it's rock solid. And I don't want to take off our gloves. But fingers crossed that we'll get some live fish from there. Although the methods used to catch fish remain largely unchanged, ice fishing, or dongbu as it's known in China, has now turned into something of a tourist spectacle. Apparently 30,000 people have turned up for today's show. We've just arrived at the most important location in this festival. Just to give you an idea of how big this festival is, this is the sixth annual ice fishing festival here. Uh, originally, there was no festival. Originally, it was just a local Manchu who came here uh, to fish in ones and twos and provide some winter sustenance for the families. So the fish are starting to come out very slowly. We've got a tractor over there pulling the net out. Um, the thing that's a bit, a bit different about ice fishing in China is they only use one net. This net is 800 meters long. So currently we have um, a lot of fish being brought up from this net. Just to let you know that we're being very environmentally friendly. The holes in this net are quite big. They're about 12 centimeters across, which means that only middle-aged fish will be caught. The little ones uh, under about one and a half kilos will be let go. And currently, this is the culmination of several days of hard work, working in minus 20 degree weather. The fishermen have been here since sunrise, making holes in the ice. This is one huge net, and all of these are carp. Um, I've been told that today there should be about 80 to 100,000 pounds of fish, which translates to about 40 to 50,000 kilograms worth of fish, which is a big haul. It's not record-breaking. In 1998, they were able to manage. They were able to haul up 430,000 kilograms of fish. But still, this is fantastic. You're the first one to come. First one. How do you feel? Yeah, it's very good. 那您原来没有捕鱼过吗？有捕鱼没有那么多，没有那么大规模的是吧？没有那么大规模。He is also an ice fishing enthusiast. He also does this, but obviously not on such a large scale. The shamanic traditions of the local Manchu people dictate that instead of being auctioned off to the highest bidder, the biggest fish is set free. The rest, however, are fair game. In Chinese, the word fish sounds like abundance, and people start the new year by eating fish to bring them good luck. Which is why much of today's catch will be sold to local restaurants, or to businessmen who want to get off on the right foot. More still, are we packed into vans and delivered to the homes of online shoppers. But if you want the choicest carp, you'll have to fight for it. Oh, so this is where the action is happening. So now that the, uh, the tourists have left, a lot of hardcore business and haggling is going on. All of these fish are being auctioned off now. The smaller ones are going for maybe two, three hundred quires, about 20, 30 pounds each. The bigger ones, 500 and up. So even though they're quite pricey, a lot of people are very willing to buy them because it's a symbol of prosperity and they might share it with their family or give it to neighbours or friends and uh, it'll be a good start to the new year. Oh wow, you've got to say what a festival. I mean this is an annual ice fishing festival but there are lots of smaller scale ice fishing festivals happening here. Obviously not as many tourists, not as big as a frenzy, not as many fish but it is a way of life here in uh, Heilongjiang province and also something that's continued for centuries and hopefully will for many years on as well. After catching all that fish, there's only one thing left to do. Bizarrely, people in the US don't eat carp. They think it's a bony bottom-feeding pest. Well, here in China, the fish is practically revered. There's even an idiom about carp turning into a dragon. 
a reference to success achieved through hard work. Maybe that's why there are so many recipes for carp in China. You can steam it in soy sauce, ginger and spring onions, red braise it, crispy fry it Sichuan style, drown it in sweet and sour sauce. There's even a popular dish consisting of just a fish head. You name it, there's a way to eat it. Well, what are they? I mean, after watching all that fish being pulled out of the hole in the ice, you just got to sit down to a fish feast. But it would be weird if I was just sitting down and eating by myself. So I've joined this lovely family who um, who've come specifically for the festival. <laughs> the guest of honor is the son-in-law, who's flown almost 3,000 kilometers from central China to join us here today. A fish feast like this is not cheap, but it's a symbol of prosperity and will hopefully give this family so much good luck they'll be up to their necks in it for the rest of the year. Coming up next, I carve it up with the country's best powder heads as I ride the trails at Yabali, China's largest ski resort. Well, after all that fortuitous fish, I've decided to try my luck at Yabali, China's largest and probably most famous ski resort. It's about a three hour drive north of Jingpo Lake, but the safest, cheapest and easiest way to get here is by train. Oh, look at that. This is the best train station in the world. Check it out. You can see the resorts from here. To be honest, I didn't even know this place was served by a train station, but you can actually grab a uh, train all the way from Harbin. It's about two hours, about 200 kilometers to get here. And when you arrive, they have these free shuttle buses, which take you to the main hotels and of course the main resort. So I am as happy as I could ever get. Yabali comprises the three mountains of Daguokui, Aguokui and Sanguokui. The national ski teams train at Daguokui, which has the steepest slopes, while Sanguokui has a good mix of beginner, intermediate and advanced runs. There are 10 ski resorts here and dozens of hotels to choose from, so regardless of your skiing level, there's something here for everyone. Oh, this is me, gonna check in get some rest and then go skiing tomorrow.
Hmm. Do these skiers look a bit short to you? Hmm. I might be on the wrong slope. Yeah. I should probably go play with people my own age. Well, it's a good thing that the ski passes here work for every resort. And I've heard good things about Sun Mountain Yabali. After all, this is where Club Med is based. It's also one of two resorts at Yabali with ski-in, ski-out access from the hotel, which I can tell you makes all the difference after a long day on the piste. But I'm just getting started. Oh, they have doppelmeyer chairlifts here. Nothing like a nice windproof heated ride up to the top. I'm so excited. It's really cold up here. And uh, I don't know if I'm shivering with excitement or just from the temperature. On your marks, get set and go. With China set to host the 2022 Winter Olympics, families are now flocking to the resorts in the hopes of raising the next generation of gold medalists. And while Yabali is not quite Chamonix, skiing is on the up and up, thanks to China's growing middle class. It's now fashionable to ski. Not that I'm doing it to be cool. I just love the feeling of carving soft, supple snow as I hold my skis on edge. Or attempt to, anyway. Hey, give me a break. I was on a double black diamond. Anyway, with the season starting in mid-November and lasting until the end of March, there's still plenty of time for me to hone my skills. Oh, what a day. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love skiing, but I'm just a tad tired and really happy to be back in my own clothes and going home to this awesome traditional lodging. But I cordially invite you in to check out my awesome crib. Oh, oh, that's better. Let me show you around. So this place actually sleeps up to 16 people. And as you can see, the bedroom is very typical of Northeast China. You've got the heated Kang. You've got a, a pipe if you're so inclined, but I want to show you around and this place is really cool because at first I thought it was frosted glass but oh look at that it's gorgeous outside isn't it obviously this corridor is a lot colder than the rest of the house but it allows you to kind of be outside while still being inside and if you're feeling a bit peckish you can pick yourself up a nice meal here and bring it over to the dining room in this room but you know if you want to really do it in style obviously it's winter now so it might not be too viable you can come out here and do some alfresco dining with your family and friends but yeah it's a little bit cold right now so i'm gonna leave you guys to freeze and i'm gonna go meet up with the crew bye Whew. it's locked ah uh. Well, they obviously don't like me very much. Coming up next, we take you to the real-life winter wonderland of Suisyang, a former sleepy hamlet turned international sensation. What starts from a simple idea? Evolves. Multiplies. Grows into a wave of innovation, stories of success, and of inspiration. New Money, only on CGTN.
around 180 kilometers south of Yabali, is Xuexiang. Once a poor, isolated hamlet, nowadays there isn't a soul in China who hasn't heard of the place. Its name literally means snow village, and obviously you can tell why. I mean, they even have reindeers here. And originally, this place was just a tiny village, but now this main street, which was once their only street, is just ram-packed with tourists. I mean, there's so many things for people to do, all sorts of stuff to eat, winter nuts, and all sorts of hot things to warm you up, because it is minus 25 right now. But the whole reason that this place became so famous was back in the days, there were only 80 households here. And after some amateur photographers came here and took pictures of the village, it became an international sensation. And the reason why was because of this snow. In winter, there's no wind here. So the snow just piles up and up and up, it becomes meters thick, and it becomes this beautiful winter wonderland. And obviously now, it's a lot more rowdy, a lot more successful than it used to be. And this place is almost kind of like a theme park, but it is still an incredible winterscape. Xuexiang is surrounded by forests, and like the other villages in this area, grew up with the logging industry. Back then, winters were really tough, and reindeers were used to transport timber, not tourists. But after Xuexiang became famous, everything was demolished and built anew to host more visitors. The only old cabins you'll find now are cordoned off in a special paid entry photography zone. Ironically, the residents of Suixiang now earn most of their money during winter. So it's now snowing in Snow Village and if you want to get away from these dangerous bits of frozen water, then you need to hide away in these mall kolok, which are essentially log cabins that the locals used to hide away in. Honey, I'm home. What's cooking? Nothing, apparently. Oh well, it's still a very faithful rendition of a logger's house in the 50s. I mean, they've even got the tools of the trade up here. That's a two-man saw. You've got these giant forceps for carrying logs. And this would have been used for doing that too. But if you've spent the entire day working, the first thing you want to do when you get home is to grab this. But you don't know what this is. It's a cradle, because after a long hard day of work, you don't want to deal with any crying babies. All you want to do is get that cradle, hook it to the ceiling, and then let it rock your baby to sleep, because you just want to lie back on your heated Kung bed, because it's minus 25 outside. But in here, it's a nice and toasty 19 degrees. So the cool thing about this Kung is that it also doubles up as a sofa. You can sit here and drink tea, talk with friends, and then when you get sleepy, you just grab your duvet from up there, lay it down here, and go to bed watching your lovely wife. But all in all, it's a great way to escape from the winter. These days, Xueqiang is massively popular with families, in part thanks to a hit reality TV show that was shot here featuring celebrity dads capering around with their children. Notice anything similar? Well, yeah, there are so many ways to travel in style, but why not do it on a sled? Because why would you use your own legs when you could be pulled around by your sister? Or even better, why not use someone else's four legs? All right, so huskies aren't exactly indigenous to Xueqiang, but they're definitely a hit with the crowds. As you can see, the weather here is quite temperamental. While Xueqiang enjoys warm currents from the Sea of Japan, it's also buffeted by cold fronts from Lake Baikal. What this means is that for seven months every year, Xueqiang is covered in thick, sticky snow. And since the village doesn't see much sun, 
everything just sort of freezes and stays in place. The end effect, however, is a mountain village smothered in pristine marshmallow snow. A true winter wonderland. Having wandered around town for a while, I fancied a change of scenery. So I've hitched a ride up the mountain. Now this is riding in style. <laughs> yeah! Oh! It's a bit like riding a wild horse really needs a seatbelt. Oh, what a ride. Ah, oh, Sergeable. Well, <laughs> well, that's as far as a snowmobile can go. The rest of the way up is by foot. Whew. It's a thousand meter climb to my destination, but rest assured, there's a reason why it's so far away. Ah, oh, so isn't this very lovely, hey? So uh, back in the days, the northeast of China was infamous for producing lots and lots and lots of bandits. And if you come all the way up here, you can get an idea of what an outlaw outpost would have looked like. I mean, obviously there are lots of these watchtowers, uh, but now the accommodation has been turned into convenience stores and you can bring your family, your friends, or your loved one to enjoy a more romantic ideal of outlaw life. Once you've had your fill of the bandit camp, you can head even further up to a vantage point from which you get a sweeping view of the valley below. A great place for spotting your enemies, or sneaking that arm around your date's waist. In all seriousness, Xueqiang is at its best after dark. The crisp night air almost has a cleansing effect on the village. And though it might seem like there are just as many people out at night as during the day, the streets are a lot more tranquil. It's as if everyone has turned introspective, quietly appreciating their surroundings and reveling in the romance and novelty of this real-life snow globe landscape. Mm -hmm. 